welcome to the 115th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And uh, um, we've been here most Tuesdays and Thursdays for well over a year now. So if this is your first one, where have you been? Where we've been discussing a topic that is of interest to some part of the security financial crime world. And the idea of thought leadership from our point of view is that what we're trying to do is critique, understand, analyze what is going on today in order that we get a better type of service, a better type of understanding in the future. So it's not to try and solve the world's problems in 45 minutes. We don't assume that would be possible, but it is an opportunity to think about what's going on and to learn the lessons for the future. And those of you who join before will know that we always have the same format, which is that uh, we have three panelists. Uh, I invite them to introduce themselves and then uh, um, we go to audience questions. Well, we're definitely gonna go to audience questions. We've got a slightly different re, uh, way of doing it today. Today, we're talk tackling a sort of topic which I think is really, really, really important. It's cropped up in previous webinars and it's about the role of the victim. What is it like to be a victim of financial crime and how might we better respond? And what better way than speaking to two people who've got, unfortunately, direct first-hand experience of being victims and a an national expert uh, who's been involved in this area. So without further ado, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce our panelists today. Now, for different reasons, they're not on camera. So um, SNC are uh, uh, our two uh, people who've been involved in being victims who were duped by a fraudster. Uh, but Neil was in the background, uh, so perhaps Neil, I'll come to you first. Neil, can you just introduce yourself? 20 seconds on uh, your role and what you do. Yes, of course. Uh, good afternoon, Martin, and good afternoon to everybody else that's listening. Uh, my name is uh, Neil Postins, and I work for the National Economic Crime Victim Care Unit, which, is, which sits under the umbrella of uh, Action Fraud. So Action Fraud is the central reporting centre for all victims of fraud and cybercrime. And um, I work with um, a team of uh, advocates and um, care providers who support victims of fraud and cyber cybercrime. But I'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, in a short while, Martin. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that sounds good. That no, sounds good. OK, thanks very much. Indeed. Well, let's get straight to our story. And I'm going to go to C first. I'm just going to call you C because um, uh, um, we're getting you to speak about a very personal incident and uh, very specific. But thanks for joining us. Lee. I really appreciate you coming on. So can you just tell us, first of all, how this all started? What happened to you? All right. Well, I guess like many of these cases, it started with a phone call and it was actually a voicemail. Uh, so it was... Um, as far as I remember, an automated, um, fairly standardized um, message saying, you know, you, we, we need to get in touch with you. Uh, I forget the details now, but you know, uh, please call us back at this number. Um, and this was an HMRC uh, reference. So that was, you know, from the, uh, the government tax department. Uh, not a lot of specifics. Um, anyway, uh, later in the day, um, I, I did not call back on that. Um, but later in the day, uh, just as I was about to walk out, um, you know, to, to go pick uh, kids up from school, uh, I got another call. And, you know, this time I answered it. And it was a similar call. It said, you know, we've been trying to get in touch with you. Um, and, you know, and, you know here, here are the details. And so it was a, at that point, it was a bit of a script. So I guess, you know, they got in touch with me. Uh, they didn't know if they would or not, and it was you know getting on in the day, so there was some sense of urgency on on their part. So uh, I explained I had to leave. You know, if there was a you know um, other way to get in touch, perhaps you know to to write to me. Um, but they said no, and it was very important we we talk and, and clear this up um, because it was time sensitive. So. Shall I uh, carry on with? Yeah, please don't uh, carry on. I mean, it, this is fascinating. Just, um, or did you got any questions? By the way, do use question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll endeavour to get to you. Carry, carry on, please. All right. So um, this sounded quite authentic to me. Um, after all, I um, you know, had this uh, received some messages from the HMRC recently. I had been on their website. Um, you know, I, I had a, a late uh, charge um, you know, to pay. I took care of that. 
Um, so I thought this was, you know, just a routine follow-up. Um, when I asked them, you know, why they hadn't sent me a letter, uh, there were some sort of circumstantial problems here that where this probably wouldn't happen now, but we had not been receiving uh, any mail, any post for uh, almost a month because of the pandemic. Uh, I think this was the, the summer. Uh, our postman was um, on holiday or, or sick. There was nobody to cover. Um, you know, this was a problem all across the country. So I said, you know, I haven't received this letter that you've referred to. Uh, they said, well, you know, um, you know we, we've sent it out. Um, you may not have received it, but you know, I'm, I'm sure it will come. But you know, this is this is the contents of the letter that we did send to you, and they had and they had someone someone read it. Uh, so at that point, um, I think they said, you know, we we can, you know, this needs to be escalated to the next level. Yeah, and so you know, they, they put me in touch with someone else. Um, you know, mention various uh, titles, you know, department names, uh, badge numbers, and actually made me write down or ask that I write down those details, which I did. Um, and then uh, they, they kind of went on. And by this time, I had left the building. I was on my phone. I was heading out to pick up the car. And so I was uh, walking and, and talking. Uh, and they said, look, this um, is... You know, has escalated. We've sent you letters, um, but you know now it looks like you know we we need to go to sort of court proceedings, which was you know very surprising to me because I hadn't heard anything about that, not a text, a letter, or anything. But it is court proceedings for you not having paid the bill they said you had to pay. Yes, the things things had escalated in in some way without any details. And again, I, I didn't get re details. A bit light. On, on all this, they just basically said, look, um, we're just calling to tell you that this has been handed over already to you know, our chief legal affairs department. There's not much we can do about it at this point. Um, so they weren't asking for money. Um, in, in fact, they kind of made it difficult to, to even talk about that. So I, I said, okay, so you know, what, what is it? What is this? Um, you know, financial penalty, um, you know, how much is due? Is this, you know, could we settle this out of court? I mean, does it have to go, you know, and, and proceed? Um, I mean, there are lots of reasons not to, to go to, you know, to court on that. Yeah, right. So um, they said, well, there may be, uh, I'll you know, need to contact various people. Um, and actually, I think at some point, during this conversation, I had been cut off. It might have been because I got in the lift or, or something. But they had given me some numbers to call back. And uh, I, I tried a few of those numbers. The first one was um, just a message. It was the you know, Crown Court something or other. So they had given me a, uh, a legitimate phone number, uh, but probably one they knew wouldn't, wouldn't pick up. Mm. Uh, so I worked my way down the list, and, and eventually they, uh, there was a, a line that they picked up on. So again, they weren't calling me. It was just, I guess they were relying on me going through the, these numbers and can sort of help to prove their legit legitimacy. Um, then, um, yeah, but by this time, I was under a bit of time pressure also. My, my phone was almost out of battery. And I said, look, I, I'm going to get cut off here. Um, so, you know, perhaps we can settle this another day. They said, well, you know what? Um, there is a small chance that we could settle this today. Um, so, you know, if you can, you know, go on battery saver mode or do anything you can to save your battery, that, that would be, be helpful. So, so I, I did all that. Um, went, went to get the car, and then they said, um, you know, we, you, you can uh, make a payment now, and then that will be reviewed by this team that is taking it to the court, and if uh, they, they deem that you know, um, sufficient, then, um, you know, we, we can hold off on court proceedings. And I said, okay, well, Fine, let's do that because I, I figured 
it hadn't even crossed my mind at this point that this was a was a scam call because it seemed to be um, they, you know, they presented a lot of credentials. It seemed to be um, you know it's a convincing script. I realized afterwards, but um, also there's the hesitancy to actually move ahead and take any kind of payment. Um, yeah, it, it sounded quite procedural. Clever move on their part, though, just make it all sound very real. Yeah, and then they said, "Look, um, we're having trouble getting in touch with uh, the these these people. They must be sort of um, in and out of other cases right now. Um, they're probably handling a lot of clients right now. Um, but you just hold hold the phone, and you know, I'll keep trying some other numbers." So again, this this took a while. Um, then. I think they said, okay, we're able to get through to someone um, and they will be able to provide you with uh, instructions on you know, where, where to send the funds. Um, you know, we would need this to go through today in order you know, for the, to defer uh, the, this action. Um, and we would you know, need, to, need to see the kind of receipt of that, the you know, actual acknowledgement. So I said, okay, well, fine. Um, you know, can you provide me the details? Because you know, clearly I was under a lot of you know, time pressure to right. you know, school run plus um, you know, low battery and all the, these other things. Just wanted to sort of deal with this. Um, they they would not give me any bank details. Um, I was you know ready to write it down, um, but he said, nope. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, we just it's late in the day. We can't seem to get through to anyone. Um, but, you know, if you want to hold on, then, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll keep trying some numbers. How long were you waiting for before they gave you the number? About um, 20 minutes. To, but even though they knew you had a low battery, they were still... Yes. That is incredible. These, these are cool customers, aren't they? I have to say that. I mean, incredible. So, very, so let's just speak of it. So after that, you made, you made the payment over the phone? No, actually, I, I picked, picked the kids up, um, went uh, home, got a battery uh, cable so as I could um, you know, re return the car and keep talking to them. And I think at that point, they gave they finally got, gave me the bank details. So that was probably an hour after I, I'd first um, called them. And then it's, they said, OK, uh, you know, we've, we've received this. Um, and you know, now we can tell you about the next steps. And that, just to get to the point on this bit, then, uh, see, they, 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 you, you paid the money. Yeah. Um, and were you under what point, if at all, did you become suspicious? Not until um, quite a bit later, actually, when this was all done. In fact, uh, even after making the payment, um, they they said that. Um, there was a certain pattern and that they would only accept this if um, I made an additional payment that would be held in um, sort of reserve or escrow or something and would be, um, uh, I, I, that would be used uh, for any later taxes. In other words, if uh, I had taxes payable in the future, they would take it out of that account, almost like a, uh, an amount that they would hold it was, they said, you know, this is your money, but you know, we will keep it in a, kind of a reserve fund almost, you know, to, to guarantee that this doesn't happen again. And did you, did you make that payment as well? Um, well, at that point, I, I feel I, they said, you know, without that, then we will proceed with the um, court actions. So in other words, those are a two-step yes. payment. So they said the first part was they reviewed it and they decided it was not sufficient or not a sufficient guarantee during these you know, negotiations with their court people. So um, I th it sounded like this was not money I was losing. Um, it was just being set aside and it would be a, a payment against future taxes owed or would even be refunded later mm. if, you know, if there was a refund due. So at that point they said, okay, fine. Um, so this has gone through. Um, now we'll tell you about the details and here's what, here's the paperwork you need to, um, we'll set up an appointment for you to come in and meet with us. 
And they said, you know, we have a couple of locations. You can choose the one that works for you. Um, we'll set up a date for you. Um, I think it was like a, a day or two later. And they said, and that gives you time to, you know, prepare the following things that you'll need to bring. So at that point, it wasn't even about the, the money. It was about, I mean, they could have just hung up then, I suppose, but uh, they, they won't. Um, I, I expect they were buying time. See, that was what they were doing. They were just buying a bit of time before you got suspicious. Hmm. That seems to be their take. So just very quickly, so at what point did you become suspicious? Because I don't want to turn to... to well, uh, actually, uh, I was a bit suspicious right from the get-go, but um, I think some of those concerns went away as they sounded more legitimate. Uh, because I've you know, mm -hmm. received a lot of scam phone calls and scam emails, and you know, I've had training um, at work on what to look for. So, but most of that applied to sort of email type scams, phishing scams, not phone scams. And this was, a lot of this was kind of, I was a victim of circumstances in some ways because yes. you know, the lack of postal delivery yeah. Um, they caught me just as I was walking out. Um, the low battery on my phone meant I couldn't really go browsing websites um, and doing a lot of other things which would drain, drain the battery. So, so I was out and about in the car driving a lot of the time and it was difficult for me to actually check names, credentials and even the, uh, the bank account and the, the name of the person they sent me, I now, afterwards, um, when I was explaining to um, my wife what, what happened here, um, she said, well, how do you know it's not a scam? Well, let me just, to that point, let me just, that is, that is a perfect introduction. You've done it better than me. All right. So yeah. let me speak to your wife, because um, okay. um, I also say right. that um, um, uh, C's wife is actually with us on this webinar too. Um, um, so let's ask, S, S, you immediately, you heard this story, did you immediately think this is a scam? Well, um, so yes, when he told me the whole story, um, I knew it was a scam. But before that, um, um, you know, I, I was just really upset by the whole thing because um, when, when he took the call, um, I had a really bad feeling when I, I, I could hear him, he was getting on the lift and I could hear this other man's voice, um, you know, over the phone as one does sometimes. And he was speaking in a way that, I don't know what it was, it, maybe it was just my answer, but it gave me the creeps. It just, I just had this sort of, you know, shiver and, and I just felt something was really wrong. And the minute, and then when he left, like a couple of minutes later, I tried calling him frantically and um, he wouldn't pick up the phone. And then finally he did. And he said, I can't talk to you. I'm really busy. It was almost like he was completely hypnotized uh, by this person talking to him. And um, so I'd had that feeling all along and he was, I could tell he was very stressed and very busy. And this person had put the fear of, you know, God into him and, um, and then at the end, you know, after the children had gone to bed, he explained the whole thing to me. And that's when I said, I said, how do you know this isn't a scam? And his face just went completely pale. And I think I, I got the feeling he had suspected it all along. He had known it all along, but mm -hmm. he, because this person was so good at sort of hypnotizing him and making him feel and giving him the confidence that what he had done was the right thing. He hadn't like admitted it to himself. And then when I said that, his, it was like the color just drained out of his face and he immediately Googled it. And he was, um, you know, he was just absolutely shocked and aghast. And if I could just add that, even then it was not entirely clear because a lot of the facts that they gave us checked out when, when you Google them. Yeah. Um, and then interestingly, some of the things like the badge number and uh, certain names that they gave us uh, showed up in other people's um, scam stories uh, where wow. even the badge numbers that they, they gave us had been used before. So you know, almost like a script. Yeah, okay. So what did you do then? So, so just very briefly, so this is now late at night, you're, you're having this conversation and awareness is dawning on you what's happened. What, what did you do? 
So um, we immediately um, made some calls. Now, some of the, so the money that had been transferred, some of it was from our bank, but some of it was from liquid funds like um, TransferWise, and I forget the name of the other, um, um, the other account, but something like that, like TransferWise. And the money had been transferred from that. So there's no way, and that's instantaneous. You can't get it back. So, I mean, there was absolutely no way to do anything. We contact them. It was just awful. We couldn't get a hold of anyone. We had to go down um, all these different flow charts that they had, like all these links, and there was no number, nothing. And this is um, at the banks you're talking about, the financial. No, this is like the 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 transfer, the money transfer. Yeah. Okay. Apps yeah, yeah. That we use, the bank uh, did did respond to us right away. They had some kind of outsourcing person. It was in a different country. They talked to us. They said someone will be in touch with you. And uh, we also called the police, the fraud uh, department, and we talked to them. And then, um, and then I, they followed up with us after that. Were they helpful? Um, well, the policeman who came to the house, yes, they were very nice. Um, the policeman who came to the house, there were two of them. They um, gave us, they were very sympathetic. They told us, in fact, one of them had been scammed himself. And uh, so, um, but they said, they said, look, it's really unlikely you're gonna get any money back. And we were just shocked because we said, look, we know where these people are. I mean, we know, we know they're here, they're in the United Kingdom. They're calling- and I hit, I say, That's an important question because Dana Adams, who was a former panelist, um, mm -hmm. um, has asked that specific question. How did you know they were in the United Kingdom? Well, first of all, they, um, I think the number was U uh, UK. So we, we assumed, um, but you know, it was little things. Um, so they they had they they spoke in South Asian accents. They were Pakistani or Indian. I was pretty sure they were Pakistani because they were all Northern Indian. Because um, uh, I'm part from that part of the world, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, they 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 had that sort of combined inflection in their accent, which sounded. They used some words in very British ways, and other words. So I I had and and. Um, and so uh, I think some, some of the numbers were also local. So I just put that together and and um, and, and figured they were in the UK. Um, I also, one of them also when I, uh, so I did actually call them back and I screamed at them and told them, you know, and they pretended they didn't know what I was talking about. I said, you've stolen our money, you're thieves, you're criminals. Uh, until Karen told me not to do that. She said, they know where you live and don't do that, please. Um, but um, but I did call them back and I heard, uh, you know, and then and um, and then they sort of abused me. They just used really bad language, screamed at me, put the phone down after pretending that they were with the uh, with with the tax department. And then they sort of didn't even bother putting up, you know, putting their their cover on. They just screamed and, and hung up on me. So, OK, let me just stop you there, because yeah. that's the context. Now, let's bring in Neil. Neil, you've heard that now, of course, um, from where you come from, I guess that's not a particularly unusual story. What's um, first of all, what's your takeaway and what's your response to, to the story? Yeah, well, I think the, the first thing I, I should say is uh, thank you to CNS for sharing their experience. Very brave. Um, very brave indeed. But um, I think what we need to say is that criminals, especially fraudsters, are very, very good at what they do and very good at convincing people who, uh, in, in these circumstances, had other things on their mind, uh, may have been a little bit distracted, but they are very good at impersonating people and providing that advice. Um, so I would suggest that, um, you know, you should never feel ashamed or embarrassed if you've been scammed uh, by any of these people. First thing you should need to do is report it to the police or get onto your bank straight away if you think that you have been scammed, which they did do. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it, it mirrors a number of similar frauds that we obviously see and that the team I work with who contact victims um, obviously speak with victims who have suffered similar types of frauds. And, and I think, fortunately, what we do is um, we have a... So with the National Economic Crime Victim Care Unit, and we have um, a number of specifically trained 
uh, staff members who are who are sort of have a focused and targeted service towards supporting um, victims of fraud and cybercrime. Now, obviously, we're a UK-based unit, but currently we work with 20 forces across the country uh, in order to help victims to cope and recover from the sort of circumstances that CNS have um, described. But what does, what does recover, cope and recover mean, though? What, what can you do? It's done. It, it is done, um, but we're, we've been fortunate so in the last, um, since June 2018, we've um, supported victims to recover in the region of £767,000 of stolen money. And we do that by um, working with the victim, spending some time with the victim and helping them, uh, signposting them or referring them to relevant agencies and organisations and governing bodies that can also help them. So that cope and recover um, is about the victims getting their confidence back, especially if they've been scammed online. They might not want to go back online, but you know and I know and, and most of your audience know that everything nowadays is online focused. So it's to help them cope and recover, get their confidence back. But the key, one of the key things for us is to prevent them from becoming a repeat victim. Yeah. So we provide uh, that sort of protect advice, um, crime specific, crime prevention advice in order to, for them to get back to that cope and recovery situation. And does that work, Neil? Do you got any evidence that by intervening, you, you prevent repeat victimisation? Yes, we have. So um, since inception, so the unit came into being in 2014. Since then, we've engaged with just over 120,000 victims. Since June 2018, I think it is, uh, we've recorded um, something like 36 repeat victims. So that's 0.03% of victims that we've worked with that have actually come back to us as repeat victims. Okay. So so let's just go back to, to see this for a second. So um, did you get any of that sort of support? Um, I, I did not. Um, I, I've been hearing uh, every week almost from the bank. Um, so this was for the last I don't know, six months uh, or so. I've been getting so weekly texts saying that they're still looking into the scam claim and that they're sorry that it's taking longer than expected. And it just seems like a, a robotic text. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'll ever... Um, see the end of those texts uh, or, or get any sort of um, resolution. Um, but I mean, it'd just be nice to, to know if the, the case is closed uh, or if it's being pursued or, or what the bank's doing about it, if anything. Um, and if I am getting reminders that I'm still looking into it, it would just be nice to know if that's genuine or not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Neil, can I come back to you on that? I mean, that's an interesting, but one of the things we do know, Neil, across a whole range of crimes, particularly this sort, is that people want to be kept informed about what's happened. They appreciate sometimes I'm not going to get my money back, but they want to know at least that this is being managed. Um, now, you said you work with 20 forces. Well, there are 43, aren't there? So, so does that mean not, not all are, are working with you? No, so... Um... We were a um, proof of concept model because our, our service aims to bridge the gap between um, the victim's code of practice. So those victims that report to the police and their cases being investigated um, would fall under the victim's code of practice. And within there, there are specific guidelines that um, policing law enforcement has to follow in terms of keeping a victim updated. We deal with those victims whose... Um, report will not be allocated for further investigation. So uh, in terms of um, the 20 forces, we initially started with uh, the Metropolitan Police and the City of London. We then uh, expanded the proof of concept to work with six other forces. And since June last year, we've worked with an additional 14, bringing it to the 20. We aim to... Uh, engage with a number of forces throughout the remainder of this year and early next year with a view to having national coverage in order to support victims nationally. Okay. Now, what, what I would just say to there, Martin. Yeah, carry on, carry on. The C, 
um, or S report. I know they reported to the police, but I'm not sure whether that report was registered with action fraud. Um, yeah, so let's go to CNS. I was going to ask, so just to be clear for people overseas, in the United Kingdom, when you report a fraud, you don't report it to your local police force, which would often be the norm. You report it to a national reporting centre, which coordinates all the fraud cases. So um, um, CS, did you report it to the police? You obviously did report it to the police because the police came and saw you. Do you know? Do you recall how you reported it to the police? Uh, yes, actually, they came around and took a deposition. Uh, it was very How did they know about it in the first place? Did oh, you... um, we we called them, notified them. Maybe it was um, it was actually through action fraud. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we filled out a lot of details, but I mean, a lot of these details are unknown, like the name and address and you know, phone numbers of you know, the, the perpetrators. I mean, we, we gave them the, the one phone number that did actually seem to work um, and was connected to them. Um, but, you know, there are also the, the bank details and the bank names. So I was hoping that that would be a good lead uh, that they could use to, um, you know, find um, the perpetrators or, or perhaps even you know, recover some funds. So you'd be getting an update from the police, sorry, from the bank. From, have you got any update from the police at all? Uh, no, just an acknowledgement. Um, OK, yeah. OK. So, so what do you want to happen now? Uh, it would just be nice to know if you know the case is closed or if uh, they they think that there's some um, something they could do to identify and, and you know perhaps close this this scam, uh, at least using the same equipment, script, and, and people. I mean, I know that, that this model can be replicated, but uh, I was surprised uh, when you know, we we googled the details to see that you know the same script had been used in a number of other cases. So, I mean, they have been active for a while. So I was okay. hoping that, you know, by passing on this information that we could at least, um, you know, shut down, you know, this particular um, fraud. Okay. Now, before I, before I come to Neil, I'll ask you for a comment on Neil in a second. Let me just come to, to S and just say, what do you want to happen? I, I would like these people to be, you know, brought to justice. I mean, I just think it's outrageous that they do this and they have the script and it's people have shared these stories online and uh, these are dangerous people. They're, you know, uh, very good at what they do and they're just continuing to um, defraud, you know, people. And, and I just like to see them brought to justice. OK, and of course, it, it was quite a bit of money in this case. I mean, um, do you have any hope, uh, S, of getting the money back or are you? Are you um... No, I think we've sort of agreed to kiss it goodbye and just chalk it up to experience. And we're sadder and wiser and a little bit poorer. But <laughs> no, we don't we don't think we're going to get the money back. So, Neil, let me come to you just for a, a comment on this then. So, Neil, um, that's the point of reporting to action fraud, of course. They can build up uh, trends and they can identify common, uh, common elements and it provides a basis for action. That doesn't seem an unreasonable expectation. Um, well, it's not clear it's being met. Neil, what, what, what is a reasonable expectation here? So um, I think it's just it's important to, just to identify that action fraud are the reporting recording centre. Um, they don't actually do any investigation. So what they would do then is um, very much like the bank started to do years and years ago. If you lose your credit card, you used to report to the police. Then it was decided that you actually report it to the bank because they're sold. So what we do is we would take the victim's um, details contact and then that would be eventually um, forwarded out to a police force for investigation. Now, obviously, I don't know how long ago... Um, C suffered this fraud. Oh, let's, just, let's just clarify that. See how long ago was it, roughly? About six months ago. Yeah, I was going to guess six months. So six months ago, Neil. Okay, so um, I mean, obviously, without too much detail, it'd be very um, wrong of me to sort of make any comment. No, I appreciate that. We're talking about just what happens when it doesn't seem unreasonable, their expectations that if the idea of a reporting centre is to identify trends, that it would provide some basis for collating this sort of material and then acting on it. That's where I think the, uh, the question comes yeah. from. And um, my colleagues within the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau do a lot of work um, in relation to these sorts of scams and, and you know websites and things like that. So they're proactive at taking websites down. They're proactive at working with other law enforcement agencies. Um, 
and and local forces to to build that intelligence picture up. But clearly, what people want, as has been mentioned, is to get their money back for people to be prosecuted and get their money back. Um, that can be extremely difficult, which is why we have um, my team are um, you know specially trained staff to help support victims. And as I've mentioned, we've assisted uh, a number of victims to get their money back. So um, th there are avenues that can be taken, but, uh, but in answer to your question, yeah, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's what people want to do and, and there's no reason why they shouldn't have their money back. People shouldn't be prosecuted, but it, it is very difficult sometimes to identify the source of these frauds and, and you know, even which country they're coming from. OK, so let me just go back briefly. I want to get a question from Sarah, if I could come to both CNS. We're running out of time, so I'll ask you to both be brief. And um, um, Sarah's question is, uh, um, what's the main takeaway for you? What's the key? No, having been through this tragic experience and um, all of us are vulnerable to this one, I think we can safely say that. What's the key takeaway you would give to others about what to look for? So I come to see, I come to us and I come to Neil for a final comment. C first. Uh, I would say uh, get confirmation through multiple media. Uh, so never just transact through text, email, phone, or uh, letters. Uh, get confirmation through multiple channels. They should check out and you have more to, uh, to investigate. And none of these things should be that time sensitive. Yeah. And I guess the, I guess the, the, the bit about where they were lucky, see, with um, the fact that you're already dealing with HMRC, do you think they realise that? Is there a way they could have detected that or were they just lucky? I think this is just a volume game that they just try enough people. Yeah. Um, and even the, the, the person who was really good actor, I mean, just he was oh, yeah. brilliant. Um, he was not the first person I spoke to. So they had a lot of other people fielding calls and escalating their way up through the chain. Um, until they bring in the heavy hitters. Okay, thank you. Let's just come to to, um, to S now. Very, very brief, S, you wouldn't mind, because we're running out of time. Uh, your main takeaway, what's the main thing that you would say to look for to others? I would say when you get a call like that, don't panic uh, and don't feel pressured and talk to your spouse or somebody in the house or pick up the phone and call a friend and just talk it out with someone. Um, they, 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 these guys work like abusers. They try to isolate you from everybody uh, who cares for you. So don't be isolated. Don't do it on your own. If you're, if you're doing something like this, talk to somebody that you trust. Really? Yeah, because that's doable. We can all do that, can't we? That's a good yeah. thing. Right. Um, uh, and Neil, I mean, I guess a great opportunity from your point of view. Uh, um, just from where you stand, what are the key takeaways from this experience? What, what would you advise? Well, what I would advise uh, anybody really is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, criminals are very good and they're very good at convincing you. So um, banking industry in the UK run the uh, Take Five challenge, um, campaign. But what I would say is stop. So just take a moment and think before you part with your um, banking information or personal information that could be used for you. Challenge, um, you know, consider could this be uh, fake so it's okay to reject it's okay to refuse it's okay to put the phone down and call back a number that you know uh, but most importantly protect if you think that you've been subject to a scam and contact the bank immediately as cns did and if, uh, if you're in the uk then contact the police contact action fraud and that way we can at least begin to build up a picture absolutely thank you well, I've got to say thank you so much for your uh, um, time. I just want to say particularly thank, um, um, so you just finally, finally see, uh, um, how have you been since? I've just in 30 seconds, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, have you managed to get over this and get confidence back? Has it been that that draining or how are you? Um, well, I mean, it's still traumatic. I mean, it, is, um, it really does shake confidence, uh, but it, I'm also a lot more wary now. Of, I, I'm seeing scams all over the place now. Mm. Yeah, well, inevitable. I mean, but in yourself, obviously you're traumatised by it. I know both of you have been through quite an experience. Um, have you changed bank at all? Or are you with the same uh, same bank? Have you... Uh, um, same bank? I didn't really see that as, as really the cause or a factor okay. in, in that. Listen, we could go on for ages. 
uh, uh, C.S. and Neil, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate you coming on. This is a topic, of course, that isn't going to go away, and we will be returning to it in future webinars. But, you know, C.S. was so brave uh, um, to tell their story. And Neil, thank you very much indeed. And just to let you know, a copy of this webinar will be on the website tomorrow for people to look at, and it will be accompanied by a blog that I'll write to support it. Just a few final comments, if I might. Um, um, just to say that we have a major research going on about fraud at the moment. Uh, which is a proposal to make the reporting of fraud compulsory. Uh, and wherever you are in the world, be interested in uh, any thoughts on uh, the pros and cons of making fraud, fraud compulsory. Can you see that working? What uh, would be the consequences? Would it do any good? Um, we'd be very interested in hearing from you. It's sponsored by the UK chapter as ACFE and the Fraud Advisory Panel. And uh, I think that's going to lead to a webinar in a few weeks' time. My colleague Janice Goldstraw White and I are working on that right now, so stand by. Um, also, to say another research project, completely separate and unrelated, exploring the role and job complexity of security officers in all those countries you can see on screen. If you know a security officer or anyone who works with a security officer, please encourage them to complete our survey. It's short, and what we want to understand is their view of the world. Now, we hear a lot about the role of security officers, those on the front line. What we want to know is how do they feel about things? So uh, we've had a fantastic response around the world, but we'd like more. It's open for another couple of weeks yet, so please, please, please do encourage anyone you know to complete that. Uh, also to say that uh, nominations are open for the OSPAs in Kenya, Romania, Benelux, the United States and Germany. And I'm very grateful to Team Software who sponsored the US and German OSPAs. Uh, Jimmy just opened, by the way, and more will be opening soon. So do look here um, if your country's not there yet. The entries are open, though, in those countries. Do get your questions in as soon as you can. And to say the Tackling Economic Crime Awards, the nominations are open in the UK. So if you're involved in any area of economic crime, you'll find a category relevant to you. Please do make sure you put the best people forward. Um, and also to tell you about the Cyber Outstanding Security Performance Awards. Now, this is a global initiative based on the same principle of the OSPAS, cyber security. All those associations are currently supporting. If you're involved in cybersecurity, two things. One, do get an entry in if you're good at what you do or nominate someone else. Two, if you're a member of a cyber association, get them involved with us, a worldwide initiative to recognize outstanding performance in the world of cyber. And finally, to say that we're here every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, um, all over the world, we uh, um, draw in people to listen to our webinars, thought leadership, examining today, in order we may have a better type of security tomorrow. And uh, on Thursday, the topic is the challenge posed by counterfeiting. What are we going to do? And uh, counterfeiting is a major, major issue. Uh, um, just for example, drugs and food are counterfeited and people die. Drugs are counterfeited, people don't know, and they're taking drugs that won't do them any good and they never knew in the first place. Uh, uh, it's a major, major revenue generating uh, opportunity for organized crime. We're going to be finding out for more from three international experts on counterfeiting on Thursday. Next week, very quickly, we've got insider threat. Uh, um, how seriously are we taking staff dishonesty? And also our image of security. In this world of the pandemic, what has our image been and what are the best bits? We'll be exploring those a little more on Thursday of next week. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you particularly to CNA today. A special thanks to Neil in the background um, for coming along and giving his take on it. Uh, um, that problem sadly will not go away. Um, hopefully you won't either. I hope that uh, um, we'll see you again. I'd like to think it'll be on Thursday at the same time. Um, but wherever you are in the world, until next Thursday, please join myself and my colleagues, uh, um, uh, Hannah Miller and uh, um, Christine Brooks, uh, here, 3.30 Thursday, counterfeiting, wherever you are in the world. Till then, stay safe.